Zombies spotted in Hyde Park. What was that? No! 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 Ah! Hey y'all! Jackie here, and welcome to Fantastical Follies, where we goof off and sew things. If you're new here, welcome, and if you're returning, welcome back to the insanity, my friends. This is the culmination of my Regency zombie project, creating a costume that fit perfectly into Pride and Prejudice and Zombies only sillier. If you missed the first two videos where I make a reversible pair of Regency stays out of an old dress I almost reduced to rags, and panic sew an entire Regency gown over the course of about three days, a link to the playlist can be found in the description below. This video is all about zombification. In the first part, I'll walk you step by step through how I hand embroidered and mostly hand stitched a Regency inspired reticule based on an extant design and suitable only for the landed undead. In the second part of the video, we're going to time travel back to this summer to see how I created and then promptly destroyed a Regency overdress and fichu. And if I've not said it before, let it be known. Boy, do I love distressing. We're going to have so much fun. Y'all, I'm super excited to be finally sharing this project with you, especially because it's the beginning of spooky season. If you're excited too, don't forget to hit that like button and let me know in the comments what you're planning on doing this October. Have you started your costume yet? I've got so much going on. <laughs> I should be stressed, but honestly, I can't wait. I have a lot to show you today, so I'm going to keep this intro short. Let's get started. The brain reticule. Tragically, during the Regency era, we lose the deliciously large pockets of the 18th century in favor of reticules, small, often ornate bags worn around the wrist. When I was planning this pattern, I knew that I needed to have something to carry all of my stuff. And the idea for the brain reticule was born. After all, zombies like to keep their snacks close, at hand. <laughs> but the problem was, how the heck did I make the reticule look like a brain? After a month of searching, I finally came across these instructions for a round reticule based on an extant example at the Met. The shape was perfect, and even better, the pattern was free. But how did I brainify it further? Why don't I stop babbling on the subject and show you? All right, I'm nearly done with this. And I realized I haven't actually filmed any of it because I've been doing it late at night and there's no point in filming, it would be terrible footage. So let's take a look at what I've been doing. This is the main strip of the reticule. I forget what the measurements are. Editing Jackie will put that in, but I have been embroidering it on my hoop. I have it kind of all rolled up here to keep it out of the way because I found that the, the strip, especially when it's long, just gets in the way too much. Now this is really simple, but it does take time. This is taking me hours and hours and hours to do. I may or may not do the top of the reticule as well. We will see if I have time. All right, we're just gonna have to do voiceover for this. The technique I'm doing here is called vermicelli embroidery, probably because of its resemblance to said pasta. I learned it from a tutorial by Maggie from Paisley and Glue. I've linked to it in the description below. It's a really great and quick video that goes in depth how to do this. But the long and short of it is you're doing something called couching, literally just perking up from the back and wrapping your thread down over the cord to create one little tack every say quarter inch or so. It's very simple and the nice thing is you don't really need to draw the design out. I'm using one millimeter wax cotton cord for this and matching embroidery floss as thread. You really want to make sure your thread and cord match so the eye is drawn to the embroidery and not the couching stitches. I'm making random and varied loops and squiggles, making sure that I don't squiggle my way into a corner I can't then squiggle out of. The main thing is that you want this to be a one continuous line. No breaking the line to seam or anything. I'm going up and down the short width of the strip. Each column is about an inch wide, but I'm making sure my edges vary so the lines aren't obvious. Unfortunately, I didn't realize exactly how long it was going to take. As I'll show you here in a minute, I started out much tighter and closer together and then gradually got wider and further apart as I went on and got more impatient. Oh, 
All of the vermicelli embroidery has been completed. Here is the finished side of the brain. It is very obvious that my gauge changed as I went along and realized exactly how long this was going to take. I definitely think that uh, the smaller embroidery looks better than the bigger embroidery, but it is what it is. You know, I didn't realize how long this was going to take or I would have started it much earlier and I am working on a deadline now. So it is what it is. Um, I don't think it'll look bad once everything is pleated up. Here is the other portion of the vermicelli embroidery and this is the opening. So let's talk about all of the pieces you need to cut out, okay? So you need two strips that are uh, 36 inches long by 7 inches wide. Now I made a mistake on this and embroidered to the 7 inch mark instead of to like the 6 inch mark. I left like seam allowance outside. I wasn't thinking, but that's okay. It's just gonna be a little bit taller, no big deal. Um, so you need one in your fashion fabric and for me because I need to line this I you also need one of the lining fabric this one isn't so wide because I wasn't embroidering it so I didn't need the extra on the side next you need four seven by four inch pieces okay two in your fashion fabric and two in your lining these are going to be the top openings they're going to get attached to the strip you also need two five inch round stiffening pieces. I have used just cardboard. This is like cardboard from an envelope box. Um, I recycle these from work. Um, you can use like a cereal box, that kind of cardboard. I will let you know at the end of this whether I think you need anything stiffer, but for now, this is what we're using. And then you also need six, six inch circles, four in your lining and two in your fashion fabric. I have decided to embroider the designs on my fashion fabric. I was going to paint them because I knew it was going to take longer to embroider them, but I was thinking this morning, you know, I'm just going to like it better if I embroider it. So I'm gonna do it. They're small enough that I should be able to knock out each one of these in a night. Um, I'm not gonna go super crazy. You know, there's not gonna be a lot of satin stitching in here. It's mostly going to be outlining. So it shouldn't take me too long, fingers crossed. Um, this does look, and this is probably upside down. So here, there is the got brains. Um, it does look really, really weird right now because my ink bled. Um, this fabric has been awful to work with as far as tracing things. Um, the, the friction pen doesn't completely erase off of the fabric and this bleeds. So it looks really ugly, but it'll look really good hopefully by the time I embroider it and wash off the blue ink. I am going to now start assembling the sides. I'm gonna do as much as I can now. Hopefully once the uh, circles are done, then I can assemble the whole purse together. I'm quite mad at myself for not checking the measurements of my embroidery. As you can see here, the lining is now too small. I decided to extend it using scraps. Once the side and the edge were extended, I flatlined the lining to the embroidery wrong sides together using my serger. You don't have to line this purse, but because of the embroidery, I did. Otherwise, things would catch on the thread on the inside of the reticule. Okay, skipping ahead a bit because I screwed up. I will say the instructions I'm using while free aren't as easy to follow as I'd like, but what I am doing right here is turning up the edges on both long sides. You'll see why in a few minutes. Here is the correct way to attach the top opening. Fold the strip up so the short ends are facing each other. See how my seam allowance on one side of the top is a full inch and not a half an inch? This is going to get folded over to make the channel for the drawstring. Arrange them so that the short edge is touching the ends of the strip. Now because of my embroidery mistake, my edges don't match. What you're seeing here is me fiddling with the pieces to try and split the difference. I turned under the drawstring edge and seamed to make a little casing. There's a huge gap here and I'm hoping the drawstring string will suffice to keep it closed. Now, pin the tops right sides together with one end of the strip. Make sure you mark the bottom of the drawstring. You don't want to sew it shut. Then flip the whole thing over and pin the other ends to the other side of the strip. Your goal is to make one continuous tube. Sew the seams and press open the edges. Now is the actual time you should turn up your outer edges of the tube. Not when I did it before, but eh, we get there in the end. Sew down the outer edges. If you didn't edge finish them like I did, or actually did your measurements correctly, you'll want to turn under twice, but I only turned under once. Now the cartridge pleat. First, make small dots quarter inch apart along each side of the strip. 
This is going to take a while. On skirts and things, you really want to make two rows of stitching, but this strip is bulky and just for a reticule, so I'm only going to do one row on each side. A gazillion hours later. Hand baste along the dots using a running stitch. Cartridge pleats are pretty easy, but they do take time. It's not really something you can do on the machine. Or at least I don't know of any machine that can make stitches this long. Okay, that's all we can do for now with the pleats. Let's move on to the centers. Ta-da! Here's my completed embroidered front. Brains! To assemble the medallions, you're supposed to use a circle of batting between the layers. But I didn't have any and I didn't want to buy any, so I pulled some felt out of my stash instead. I cut two 5 inch circles, one 4 inch and one 3 inch for each medallion. Center these on the back side of your embroidered piece and then lay the cardboard or whatever you're using for stiffening over top. Then cover all with one piece of your lining and pin it all the way around so it looks like a little moon pie. Off camera, I hand basted it together. Then on the back, tuck all the edges inward and pin them smooth. You want to pull tightly, but not so tight that the cardboard starts to warp. And make sure you pin at the points top and bottom left and right before hitting the sides, as the stuff in the middle likes to shift around. Then get your Devo hats on, people, because we're going to do a lot of whipping. Start by whipping the edges down to the back. Once that's done, you should have a nice, neat little circle. I then traced around it onto my backing. Then I'll gently press the edges inward along the tracing line just to get it started. This doesn't have to be perfect, we just want to coax it a little. Then place this piece over the back of your medallion and pin, making sure all the raw edges are covered. Then whip that baby down. Okay, let's put this thing together. This is by far the hardest part of the process, so buckle up. Here's my completed disc, all nicely stitched down. First, quarter your strip and mark on both the top and the bottom, or uh, front and back, I guess, technically. Then derp for a good five minutes, trying to figure out how the heck to do this because the instructions aren't very clear. Okay, gather all the stitches down and place it right sides together so that the finished edge of the strip is along the edge of the medallion and the other side of the strip is facing in toward the center of the medallion like an unopened flower. Okay, now get some doubled wax thread and your thimble. You will definitely want your thimble for this because it's tough on your hands. Start whipping through the cartridge pleats into the edge of the medallion. Take your time and make sure you're catching both ends of the pleats. You really want to pull tight and make sure you take smallish stitches because if you're like me, this bag's going to get some abuse. Hello, how are you? <laughs> All right, so it is just about done. All I have to do is turn it right side out and put in the drawstring. But before I do that, I wanted to explain to you how I sewed on these medallions. Now the first one you saw pretty well last night as I was filming it. I really wanted to show you how I got the second medallion or the back on. Unfortunately, it took me a good half an hour to figure it out. The pattern that I'm following does not give any information at all. It just says, sew on the back. 
just the same as you did the front. Well, it's not that easy. I have wished that I had been able to show you as I was doing it, but it was really late and I just was ready to be done with this. So I'm gonna take you down onto the board and attempt to describe how I got this sewn like this because it definitely was not easy and I want everyone to at least comprehend it better than I did at 11 o'clock last night. So let's go. So first thing I need to mention is when I sewed the front, I did my whip stitching around here. And then when I flipped it out, I went ahead and did a second round of whip stitching flat like this because there were some gaps just because of the density of the pleats and my ineptitude. So that might be a good thing for you to do if you're doing this purse. The first one was pretty simple, right? You just took the strip and laid it flat like this, right? And sewed, but then you were left with the concept of how to attach this one and it wasn't that easy. So basically you need to flip it around and take the strip and once again, place it flat. So when you're sewing it, you're sewing it kind of like this, right? So it creates like a little, I don't know, accordion almost when you're sewing. And um, what I did was I used the entryway here to help get my hand in to sew it. And it did get a little tricky on the other side. And it, it, I don't know if you can tell, but it's kind of bent, but it is what it is, it'll be fine. And I did the same thing where once I got it sewed, I went ahead and did another round like this flat. This side definitely isn't as pretty as the front, which is why I did the front first and then did the nonsense with the back because I, I knew that it was going to be hard to get this back sewn. So now what we have to do is turn it right side out. Also not an easy thing and you want to be gentle because this is cardboard and it doesn't really spring back as well. Okay so you get one medallion through. So if you're thinking about making the opening of your reticule smaller you need to keep in mind that it needs to still be wide enough that it is wider than the diameter of your circle because if it is smaller than the diameter of your circle you're going to have a hell of a time getting it through the hole. Okay, so I do have some snippy snips I gotta fix. Um, so there we go. Now all we have to do is uh, put it in the drawstring. Cut two pieces of ribbon. I did 36 inches for each, but I was supposed to do 34. I think this was a little long and I may end up shortening the ribbons down the line. Finish the edges of your ribbons however you like. I like the fire away. Thread your ribbon through a tapestry needle and send it from one end of your casing to the other and then back through the other casing. Do the same with the other ribbon on the other side and then knot each end together so that they don't come out. The Bloody Overdress. If you've been around here for a while, you know that I hate having unitasking costumes given the amount of time, effort, and money it takes to make every piece. My rule is always that I either need to make part of my costume wearable in everyday life, or the costume needs to be versatile enough to change the looks for different events. So I came up with the idea of having a straight, plain Regency gown and then making an overdress out of cheap fabric, which I could then destroy for two very different looks. Now I use the same exact pattern as my Regency gown to make this overdress, excepting the front piece. So I'm going to skip a lot of the construction techniques and focus on the fun part, the distressing. If you'd like a more in-depth instruction on how to make the actual gown, you can check out the video in the card above my head. First, I had to cut out my fabric. I'm using the lining front bodice piece and not the fall front and extending it down and out a little, making the skirt just a little wider so that I can close it in front of me to accommodate for the fall front not being there. Then I assembled the bodice exactly like I did my Regency gown. And pleated the skirt, just like the other dress. Then I pinned the bodice to the skirt. You'll notice that the bodice extends past the skirt. This is for the front closure under my bust. I then tried it on my body and marked the point on the bodice where I wanted the skirt to end and pleated the skirt to that point. Notice I'm wearing my actual gown to make sure it's an accurate fit.
While it was also on my body, I pinned and folded the shape I wanted for the extended bodice. I marked my changes with a friction pen. Once I'd adjusted the other side, I went ahead and hemmed off the front edge. Then I pinned the skirt to the bodice for real. Then I sewed it on and pressed the edges down toward the skirt. I turned up the bottom edge of the bodice front and center front and stitched them down. I then finished all my raw edges except for the hem. We're gonna let that fray its little heart out. Okay, this mess is old coffee grounds, which I ran through my coffee maker with water twice. Two old tea bags that I steeped in water for about two hours. A bunch of coffee grounds from my French press that I never emptied. And a little bit of extra water. It's pretty gross. <laughs> I am going to put my brand new, just made dress into this and it kind of hurts. But um, that is the whole point of this project. So I'm tearing off some of my little threadies here. Now this is wet. I ran it through the wash twice um, with my bras with hooks in hopes that uh, the hooks would hook onto the edge of this fabric as they always do when I don't want them to. And of course, the hooks did not do that because I wanted them to. In any case, I am going to crumple this up from the bottom down and then put it in like this for just about an hour. And then I'm gonna lift up the top portion of this and let the rest of the skirt soak overnight. I want to age it down a little bit, which is why I'm putting the whole thing in there, but I don't want the whole thing to be brown. So I'm going to pull this out in just a little bit. I just want to kind of take down that bright white a little bit. I'll show you when I take this out how I'm going to arrange it. Okay, it's been about an hour. You can probably hear my little toaster oven clicking. I'm about to eat dinner. And um, before I eat, I'm going to dip my hand to this delicious slurry of slop. Um, as you can see, it's it's looking, and, and the lighting isn't great in here because it's getting late, but <laughs> it's looking pretty dingy. Um, I am going to be washing this in the washer several times before I wear this because I don't want to smell like old coffee. So this will lighten a lot. I'm going to squeeze out there. Okay, so the only bottom half is submerged. And I'm gonna pull up one piece because what I don't want is it to look even. So I'm gonna kind of just pull. I don't know how well that's gonna stay, but there, okay. So I'm gonna leave it like this overnight. And in the morning, I'm gonna throw in my other coffee grounds and let it soak and get delicious while I'm at work. I will probably pull out even more so only the very bottom is in the water for that portion so it looks a little bit darker on the bottom like I've been dragging around in the mud for a long time. And yeah, I'm kind of excited about this. It's looking really gross. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna go eat now after I wash my hands. Alrighty, I just got home from work and it's time to pull this out. This smells lovely. It looks really good. It's gross. It's really gross. Okay, squeeze it out. Not there. Try and not get on my clothes here. Probably should have changed. There we go, okay. I'm also going to do a similar thing to this scrap piece of fabric. I almost bought a scarf online today for a fichu and then I was like, why don't I just use this and destroy it? So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm not gonna leave it in as long as the other stuff because I want it to be distinguishable color-wise from the outer gown. I want it to look like a fichu. So um, I'm only gonna leave this in for an hour or two. In the meantime, I'm gonna set this outside to dry. And I'm thinking because it's so hot outside, I mean, it's like 105 degrees or something out there right now, that might help heat set in the stains a little bit. I could put it in the dryer and that would do wonders, but then I don't want my dryer to have gross coffee grounds all over it for the rest of my life. So we are going to set this out 
I'm gonna let this soak for a little bit and then when this is done, I'm gonna run everything through the wash a couple of times to get the smell out and then we'll dry it. This delightful concoction is a mixture of water with ochre and burnt sienna acrylic paint. Stir to combine, but don't stir too well. We want it a little clumpy and weird. I dipped the bottom edge of the gown into the paint, swirling around and letting it catch the ucky, undissolved bits of the paint on the bottom of the bucket. Then I let it sit for a few hours to gently soak up some of the color. Now for the messy business of adding blood. <laughs> Again, I'm using basic acrylic paint for this because it's what I had. Fabric paint that's designed to be flexible is better, but I wasn't about spending extra money for this project and was too lazy to search for my fabric medium. I'm mixing the paint here with a combination of water and Floetrol, which is a paint additive that makes paint more liquid while maintaining its color. If you've ever done acrylic pour paintings, it's the same stuff you use for that. It was a little too brickish red for me, and now I'm adding different shades of paint until I get something that looks like blood. With all that prepped, I could finally start the fun bit. I put on the fichu and overdress and fastened it. This is a very messy business. I'm wearing crappy clothes I don't mind ruining. Now when you distress, you always need to consider what's happened to the character before you start the process. Where have they been? What kind of terrain? What does the soil look like? What happened to them? Did it rain? Is it dry? Considering all this and distressing accordingly will make the distressing look much more believable. I'm now dipping a sponge into my blood concoction and squeezing it over what I fondly refer to as my shelf, the natural landing spot for bits of food when I'm eating something messy, like brains. Once I got a little blood on the fichu, I removed it and wiped off the excess paint on my hands randomly, as someone with bloody hands and no concern for their appearance might do naturally. Then I went about adding more paint. Bonus! Your distressed gown also serves as an adequate material for cleaning up the spattered paint on your sliding glass door. What I'm doing here is dipping the frayed bottom edge of the gown in paint. Then I left it crumpled out there in the blinding heat to dry.
Wow, y'all. I had no idea how long that reticule was going to take. I put down the embroidery for a long time, thinking I'd be able to knock it out quick. I think the overall appearance did suffer a little because of this decision. It's definitely a little crooked and my cursive G looks really weird because my ink bled so much on this fabric. But you know what? I love the way it turned out. The overdress was so simple and fun to make. I think I did it in a day and a half. I'd like to take down the bright white of it a little bit more, but I don't have any plans to wear this for a while, so I have time. And the reticule, oh, it's so much fun. I also had no idea how big it actually be. I love that it's huge because I can put so much in it. We'll see how it holds up. Thank you so much for making it this far. If you're still watching and you haven't already, please consider hitting that subscribe button. It really goes a long way toward getting my weird little videos seen. I upload every other Thursday and I have a big and very fun project planned for my spooky Halloween friends. And if you want more spooky content, make sure you're following me over on Instagram. My handle is at Fantastical Follies Costuming, all one word. I'm participating in two seasonal challenges this month. Oh my God. And there's lots of shenanigans happening over there. What do y'all think? Does this reticule scream brain or not? I was kind of iffy about it at the start, but once I got it together, I was like in love. Thanks so much for hanging out with me today. I appreciate each and every one of you. That's all I've got for now. I need to go start my bat dress, which I haven't even put the pattern together for. Wish me luck. Why is it every time I film, the stupid noise happens? Every single time I film. Literally, I have half an hour to do this.